Hello everybody, this is Dave Cormier at the University of Prince Edward Island. Uh, we're going to take another try at the MOOC video. Um, sorry we missed our conversation yesterday, but um, so much has happened in the last couple of days, even in MOOCs. It's, uh, it's one of those topics that's constantly evolving. And the question is always, how much do we talk about, how much of the current stuff, and how much of the overarching stuff. So I'm going to stick mostly to the conceptual stuff around MOOCs and leave the new developments on XED and their movement around the world and the new business models that are being discussed. Uh, to another discussion. Certainly a uh, quick Google online will give you a sense of where that conversation is going right now. And I could do this recording today and next week there could be a new version out. So uh, a little quick uh, introduction. I'm Dave Cormier. I'm the manager of web communications and innovations at the University of Prince Edward Island. And I'm also an educational researcher and I've been involved with the MOOC conversation well, I, since its beginning, I suppose, in its current format. I was um, one of the people or the person, depending on how you look at it, who coined the term in the first place, in response to some work that was being done by Stephen Downs of the National Research Council of Canada and George Siemens, uh, then at the University of Manitoba. And we had courses that were designed to try to follow the way the internet worked and try to explore some of the possibilities that were offered by the internet. And lots and lots and lots of people started coming out to them, and, and that sort of made them different. So. My own personal uh, research is in something called rhizomatic learning, and that's, again, about trying to think about what happens to learning whenever uh, we have all these new possibilities that are involved in them. So to start out, just so that we're all on the same basis, a lot of different definitions of what a MOOC might be. Uh, I have my own, but uh, I'm just going to follow through some of the things I think are important about uh, the word as an acronym, and then... Uh, you can mix that together with the other sort of ideas that you have and sort of opinions that, that are out there. So for me, the massiveness of the MOOC is important in a couple of ways. Um, when you get lots and lots of people involved in a conversation, uh, any kind of conversation, that changes things. So scale is different in that sense. So if you have uh, 20 students in a classroom, the chance of there being other students who are going to be similar to you and have some of the same uh, background or same interests or same needs or same requirements, is less likely. When you get lots and lots more people, there's more room for subgroups, there's more room for, um, for other people to get involved, and there's more opportunity for collaboration. At the same time, uh, it's easier to get lost, there's more information all over the place, uh, and that, that extra information is, is good and bad. You know, There's a lot more, there's a broader number of opinions, there's more chance that you'll see an opinion that you haven't seen before, there's more chance that you'll go outside of your normal group of people. If you're in one city, in one university, and you have 20 people who are going to that university, there's a good chance that a lot of those people will already have a lot of things in common, a lot of ideas in common. Whereas when you're drawing from people from around the world, I think there's a better chance of you uh, encountering new concepts and new perspectives that maybe you wouldn't have looked at before. So I think that massiveness is about the amount of content that's available, it's about the number of people, the chances for collaboration, and I think you have to hold yourself differently within something that's that big. You have to be uh, more self-reliant and you also have to rely more on creating uh, networks that you can work within. So you don't have just 20 people and you're going to work with those, you actually have to seek those people out. And creating those networks I think is critical to being able to survive inside of something that's at that scale. Openness for me is not just open in the sense of free access. Free access is important. It's a big part, I think, of the MOOC agenda. It's certainly something that's currently being threatened as people try to look for new business models to go along with that. But from my perspective, it's probably the critical element. And it's not only open in the sense of that free access, but also open in perspective, open an open syllabus in the sense that, you know, there's no need for everybody and there's no way to enforce everybody doing the same kinds of work but nor is there any need to. Um, it's very possible that of the thousands of people who have joined in to work along you end up with seven or eight different strains um, of approach that all sort of start to develop side by side. People doing towards different work, people who have different uh, backgrounds and stuff. So I think that openness um, provides a lot of flexibility. It also provides a lot of chaos. I mean, let's face it, when everybody's going in a different direction, it's much harder to check what people are doing. Um, but checking what people are doing is not so much what a MOOC is about. If you're looking for a scenario where somebody's going to help you through a learning process, well then you're going to have to 
probably pay that person something, even if that's in exchange for other services or something. If you're expecting that kind of support, then you're talking about something that is not this. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just expecting a MOOC to be able to be supportive and in, in a top-down responsibility of the instructor sense is expecting it to do something it simply can't do. So that openness has a lot of implications on how things happen. Uh, onlineness, it's one of the um, things that sometimes people look at askance and think that perhaps it's, it's almost redundant to talk about it. But the important point there for me is about abundance. You know, we're coming from an educational system that is very much um, steeped in the idea of scarcity, both scarcity of um, talent and, and knowledge, but also scarcity of access. And we've gone the other way, right? At any given time now, you can probably reach out and find somebody who knows how and knows what. And, and that abundance, and actually not one person, but rather a hundred. And our systems of verification, our systems of access, and like all those things, filtering, um, become very, very different when we move to an online space. And the idea of a course is one that, and it's interesting, a colleague of mine was uh, critiquing this not that long ago, but for me it's about setting a space, a start and end space for people to commit to a given idea. You know, there are lots of things we can learn, there are hundreds of different things we could do that could help support our work or our personal lives, but um, we can't do them all at once. And setting up a course that's five or 10 or 16 weeks, or in one case, 36 weeks, to commit to a certain topic gives you that chance to set aside a part of your life to be able to commit to this kind of learning. And I think that's important because right now we can go onto the internet at any time and learn whatever we want within reason, um, but we don't normally set aside that time in that way. And I think the course structure allows you to commit to that given thing, and it also gives a chance for everybody to start at the same place. So if there's an existing community out there and you're looking for a community learning experience, um, it can be very difficult for new people to join that community and the longer that community goes on, my experience has been the harder it is for people to join it, for them to understand the private language, for them to understand the pecking order. Whereas when you start all at the same time in a course, it gives everybody a chance to start on a, a more even hierarchical level. And as they go through that process, this is from a video um, that we put together in 2010 as part of a research grant. Um, and really it's just talking about the five steps in approach um, for how somebody can participate in a MOOC and be successful. The first part of that is to orient yourself, get to know what the rules are, what the guidelines are, th simple things like the time and stuff, and start researching the people who are you know, giving that MOOC, get a sense of how they're going to be able to do stuff, whether or not this is something you're going to continue to commit to, because the commitment to something like a MOOC doesn't happen when you sign up. It happens when you begin to engage. And one of the things that, one of the big criticisms we hear all the time is the completion rate of MOOCs are so low. But I really think that's because the idea of registration and the idea of commitment are disaggregated. They're, they're, they're unconnected. The same way that um, music downloading um, is disconnected from music listening. If you go to buy a CD, odds are you've chosen to purchase it because you actually want to listen to that specific CD. Whereas when you look at online downloads, you may download 10,000 songs from a file repository on some site somewhere on a, hosted on a desert island, but you don't actually have the intent of listening to all 10,000 songs. There may be two songs on there that you're interested in, or you may want to look through that repository for 10 or 15 songs you want. And I think that if you take that perspective to the MOOC, then we're, you realize that the registration isn't the commitment. It's once you declare yourself, once you start to network yourself, those are the, the, the markers of commitment inside of those MOOCs. So I think the dropout rates are overblown because the initial um, registration numbers, are, we're thinking about them in an old-fashioned way. So once you've oriented yourself to the way a course is structured and the things that are going to happen, and you've decided to engage in that, it's time to declare yourself. So whether that's from an existing blog or a new space that you're going to build, but you need to have a place where your identity exists and where people can find out who you are, engage with your ideas, and a place where people can verify um, and start to go through the, the process of deciding how good the information you're going to be giving is, 
how much they should be, um, how much weight they should be giving to your opinions and ideas. And that's about having your identity being clear. And that declaration is a very important part of that process. So if I look at someone's posts in a discussion forum and I wonder, well, I don't know who this person is, um, I need to start being able to track that. And that's about having a good space that I can find out who you are from. So if I see an anonymous name, and I can't find out who that person is and who they're connected to and what else they've done, I'm far less likely to, or I'm, I'm almost totally unlikely to ever work with that person. Um, but I'm also less likely to actually engage with their work because I can't find out the rest of the story about their identity. As I said earlier, the networking part is, is kind of a survival mechanism inside of something that's massive. It's true of the internet, it's true of the world, and it's true of the MOOC. Uh, you need to find people to work with and you need to start to make connections with people and engage with their work so you can start to find out how people respond and whether they fit the kinds of things that you're trying to get done. And then you can start to cluster. You can find some, you, There's no way you're going to engage with 10,000 people all at the same time. You need to find a subgroup that works for you. And the way that that subgroup starts to cluster and the, the fabric of that cluster should very much be about how you're going to focus. And that focus is what I think of as the outcome of the MOOC. So a lot of people think of uh, MOOCs and, and criticize them for uh, people not finishing them, but for me it's very much about the individual participant deciding what it is that they're trying to get done, whether that's a project or whether they just want to um, take the resources that are being there and use them for their own purposes, whatever that is, focusing on that with the cluster that you've developed I think is the path to being successful inside of a MOOC. So overall when you look at MOOCs, I mean, we, we've got uh, a trendy word that people have picked up that lots of people are leveraging for venture capital funds. There are people who are leveraging this to make changes that they've been trying to make inside their institutions for 15 years. So I don't think of it as something that is, it didn't like burst from the ground, hopefully grown. It has a long history of um, really excellent work done by a lot of people. Uh, the open educational resources movement, um, you know, open lectures have been going on for hundreds of years. Um, but the difference in this case is I think we're finally starting to understand the impact of the internet happening to education and the changes that are implicit in that and the possibilities that are implicit in that and the relative ubiquity of access inside of the Western world to internet to the internet and you know once you get over 50 60 70 percent of people in the target market that you're interested in having access to something then all of a sudden the possibilities really start to come on and I think we've finally gotten there. We finally start to understand that the internet does make education different. Uh, not better, not saying better at all, but it does make it different. It makes the possibilities different and I think to some degree it makes the goals different. Um, I think it changes what we need to get out of learning and it's inevitably it's going to change the business models. And I think in the last couple of days we've seen some really um, dramatic examples of that. So for me, personally, the MOOC is about collaboration. It's about having access to people. It's about bringing people together. Um, it's about how that changes the learning process and how it stretches out the learning process. So if I'm in a MOOC for 10 weeks and by the end of that, I'm going to have made connections with people that are going to continue going forward. Right? I'm going to have other people I'm going to continue to work with. And I think that's one of the really great outcomes of the MOOC approach. It's not connected to uh, a small cohort that just stops at the end. It's really meant to help those connections that you make from my blog to your blog and your Twitter and all those things, those connections stay exactly where they are when the course finishes. And I think that's really important. And I think that's something that you lose inside of the big MOOC systems, like inside of Coursera and stuff, where if everybody does all of their work in there, if you don't bring part of your work outside, then when those courses end, those connections get broken. I think it's very important um, when we look at this to encourage people to build their own identity and to help construct themselves that way so that the real possibilities and the real upside of the internet ends up being something they work with. And this is something that I came to through my work with EdTech Talk. It's a community that I co-created um, co excuse me, co-created with a colleague of mine, I guess 2005, and, you know, we had weekly sessions where we'd get online and we'd do interviews and, and bring in teachers and bring in educators and theorists and talk about, you know, the field of education and the technology's impact on that. 
And then we noticed that uh, we always knew we always knew the answer, right? So we're well, not necessarily the answer, but we knew how to engage in the challenges that were confronting us. And it's not because we were studying it, it's not because we'd taken courses in it. Uh, most of us um, in that community were all people who had degrees in something other than technology, and in a lot of cases, something other than education. But because we were engaged in this community, we had access to a vast network of experience um, and talent that we could draw upon to be able to to confront the challenges that we we're reaching. And I wanted to be able to bring this to my classrooms and wanted to be able to try to explore what you could do with these large communities online. But the problem is, is you can't just point over there and say, I want to start a community now. You can't make communities study that thing over there for this week. Communities are, by their nature, um, organic. And in looking at the MOOC and looking at the wor work that George and Stephen were doing in 2008, for me, it was an attempt or a possible sort of place where you could sort of artificially um, jury rig um, a community. It's not a real community, but the possibility that a community might happen. But to take some of the advantages of learning with a community and then take some of the advantages of being able to organize structure and put times and stuff on top of that. So a, a real attempt to meld those things together. Um, and I mean it is really just network learning at some point right we're talking about learning with a network and applying some of the structures to it you can think of the MOOC as a gathering place for that there's a place where people come together and can really um, can really learn this is like a colleague of mine calls it opening the same door and walking through it to learn together you know thousands of us doing that it's a place for us to, you know, you're putting the flag in the ground and going, okay, for the next 10 weeks we're going to study that thing at that place over there. And I think there's something really powerful about that. And we've got lots of universities uh, starting to do this. I'll talk about the University of Edinburgh sort of experience. I think it's one that's uh, really relevant. This is from an article, I think from early, early February. I was thinking it was an old article, but it's, it's about three weeks old. Um, there are 300,000 people signed up at the University of Edinburgh since July 2012. Um, they have six courses. It's on Coursera. Courses are all kinds of different things, right? And here's their business goal, right? This is it's a lost leader essentially. They have 300,000 people registered, and they want 8,000 of them to register for paid courses. So they're trying to show what a you know a valuable program they have, uh, how great they're teachers are, what resources, whatever sort of their drive is, um, and trying to encourage those people to register for paid courses. And that's one of the models that's out there. You know, there's also the model being used at Cornell, where you, they're giving you the first course for free, and you can pay for the second, third, and fourth course and get the credit, um, get the accreditation, so certificate that goes with that. Um, but the first course is still free. There's a model in California where they're essentially going to use introductory courses and just charge less for them and have them be massive. Now there you, you're losing the, if you want to get the credit, you're paying for that ostensibly, you're not paying for access to content. And I think that's a really important point, and I'll just talk about that for a second, is that in 2001, MIT released its content in the Open Courseware Project, saying that they knew they couldn't make any money from, from their content, so they might as well give it away, and it costs them actually to give that away through legal, fit, uh, legal bills and such. But the content is not what's happening here. And I think that with the MOOC, that's where the challenges start to come in because um, in one sense, all you're doing is opening up a bunch of content to lots and lots of people. But we're not selling that content. So in some cases, people are selling accreditation. Some people, some people are doing it just as advertising. There's a lot of models there, but it's not about the content. So let's take a look at that just through the through a tension pair, um, where you know we take two ideas and stretch them out, crisscross them, and see what kind of things evolve. So if we look at the individual learning towards nest, network learning and then distributed and curated, right? If we look at that in the MOOCs as the different ones start to evolve, the original MOOCs that we'd worked on, this were called C MOOCs now, the connectivist MOOCs. They were really distributed, they were networked. It wasn't a top-down learning process. 
the content was distributed across all the people who were actually involved in that course, and the expectation was that people would learn in a network manner. The, what I'm sort of vaguely calling hybrid MOOCs here, and I think one of the examples I'll show you in a second at the University of Edinburgh is a good example, the content is far more curated, it's far more organized, there's more of a centralized model that way, but there's still some expectation of network learning, of students learning together and building together and learning from each other. In the X MOOC model, the sort of big MOOC model, um, the content is curated, you know, so it's structured for the front end, but it's sent out to each individual student. There's no real expectation that they're going to learn from each other. And that way you're moving towards a single student being accredited for a single process or getting a certificate. And that's really about one person and what that one person has learned. It's not so much about building connections and building networks and maybe leading to communities of practice. And inside of that, you've got the learner who is coming at this as an individual, but has this whole distributed access to the content that's out there. And maybe they're part of seven MOOCs and sort of stretched and pulled. And I think uh, it's important to keep them in mind here in terms of the crazy amounts of access that they have at this point. So let's take a look at those two courses at the University of Edinburgh. This one here is the one that I was talking about as being hybrid. It's by um, some excellent educators at the University of Edinburgh. And um, it's all open access. All the stuff in here is OER. It's all IP free, so you can go in here. And this becomes a really great sort of MOOC environment for people to work around, but it also becomes, to some degree, a kind of a replicable network textbook. You know, there's a hundred resources in here that have been curated by these folks and pulled together. So anybody could go through here, look at the things that they've curated, and use those same links in another course. Essentially, they have built a network textbook that goes out to the open web. It's free to reproduce. And then they're also running a MOOC in a sense. They have weekly sort of sessions and that kind of thing pulls together. So I think this is a really interesting model. I think there's something about this model that's very threatening to uh, academic publishing, both from a textbook perspective, but also I think for the for the journal perspective as well, because uh, a closed journal is never going to make it into this course. So if you've published a really excellent article, but it's in a closed journal and there's no ac open access version of it, you can't play in this playground. Right? So these uh, folks are forced to go out and look for things that are either in open academic journals or are uh, reproductions of those that are on people's blogs or are blog posts or whatever else. And I think that really changes the way that um, a faculty member in a MOOC goes out looking for content. I think that's an important point there. Here you've got a very different model. You've got a course that's much more about um, content. In fact, um, I did terribly on these quizzes. Apparently I don't know anything about the teeth of horses. Um, I'm willing to live with that, to be honest. Because I can just find that out. I could go to Wikipedia and probably get the same information. But this is very much about an institution having content that they've built themselves, that they're delivering. So there's a value add here from an institution's perspective, which creates a whole other IP issue, I think. But I think, um, so yeah, I can imagine people coming in here and trying to take the content out as the access is free, but the content is actually hosted on Coursera rather than on something like YouTube, as we saw in the previous example. Uh, and I think we'll see institutions trying to develop their own series of content like this and being able to use that as the thing they're trading on. I think that's probably the wrong direction to take, um, but uh, because there is so, so much open content out there and increasingly all the time. But those, I think, are, are interesting juxtapositions in terms of a course that's about having a video to watch and finishing a quiz and going out, and a course that's very much about engaging with the content and creating network connection between the learners. One of the things that I think becomes really important here is the brand of the individual. If you're doing a lost leader like the University of Edinburgh where they're showing how good your institution is, you're hoping to some degree that people are going to create attachments to the individual who's teaching the course. And then you end up having people choose. I mean, University of Edinburgh is an excellent school. It's ranked in, I think, 32nd or 23rd in the world. Um, but people are going to choose that school over another school ranked in the top 35 online, probably to some degree at least because of the individuals that they've made connections with. And that changes, I think, the way that we want to be able to get, the way that we may want to have our faculty um, develop their identity. Right? So if you have somebody who is the expert or speaks about a given topic in a way that you find interesting, 
would seem to stand to reason that you're going to be interested in taking a course from that person. I think the identity, uh, the development of identities for faculty is something we're going to see increase more and more as this becomes something that people are trying to get done. Um, so I think that brand of the individual is something to look for, look at going forward. And I think that network textbook is an interesting one as well. I think that um, the textbook industry to some degree is looking more and more towards websites and collaborative environment, quizzing environments that are attached to their books and less and less concerned about the content. Certainly that's the word that I'm getting. Um, but at the same time, it's still a pretty big industry. And if you could have a MOOC that essentially cultivated the content or curated the content for a given field, you could do pretty well um, in terms of having those kinds of open textbooks, have them supported by institutions of education. So I think there's a real possibility as a MOOC being something that really helps support um, the curation of a network textbook. And I mean, I, when we talk about the student's perspective in all this, I think it's important to realize how frustrating this is for people. Um, this is very, very different than what people have been trained to understand as the educational process. People are um, trained to believe that there are set expectations that somebody's going to help them get there, somebody's going to be watching them, that those objectives are somehow connected to kinds of assessment that will prove that they know something. And to me, deep down, we all know that people cram for exams and then forget the content two weeks after they've been tested, and yet we're willing to accept that as part of the normal process of learning, even though that in this day, you know, when they were looking at new educational models in the early 19th century, they were designing educational programs so anybody could teach it, you know, so that no matter what the content was, you did not need to understand the content to be able to use the textbook, right? That's just not the world we live in anymore, right? The expertise, the knowledge is widespread, access to knowledge is widespread and we no longer have this crazy um, scarcity of access and because of that we don't need to have people remember those things in quite the same way sure there are things you need to be able to remember but those are not the high level skills that we're looking for somebody who simply remembers things is of no great value in any institution anymore as they as they once were I just want to make two more points sort of around that one of them is about the measurement of learning. If you're worried about how you're going to measure learning inside of this structure, I think you're going to worry yourself around and around and around. If you worry about people measuring people's effort, um, and I mean, to some degree, there's measuring their identity, but if you're interested in that kind of assessment, I think taking that thought that it's learning you're measuring out of the head, I think that's probably the best process. Because anybody can prove to you that they remember anything over the internet. Um, unless you want to lock them down in a cage. And certainly Pearson View, the testing organization that's part of Pearson Publishing, has um, partnered up with edX, and they're going to, they have a testing center, so I think it's in like 150, 160 countries. So there's a, there's a service there that is partnered up with edX, and I think you'll see some MOOCs doing that kind of old school assessment stuff locally inside of big cities so that you could do the MOOC and then go to that testing center. I don't think that's a model that, it's certainly not a model I support, and I don't think when we look at the true possibilities of MOOCs, trying to break them so that they can allow us to check for learning that people don't particularly need anymore, assuming you believe in that testing of learning, which I don't, I think it's the wrong path. I think it's, it's looking backwards instead of forward. And for me, the, the, the big hope with MOOCs and coming at it from my perspective is that if we all work and learn from each other, the community can become the curriculum, and the MOOC can become that that meeting place where we all learn together. Uh, thanks very much, guys, and uh, feel free to send me messages on Twitter, ask questions, or critique, or fire back. I look forward to talking to you uh, all again some other time. Cheers.